You're listening to Trek FM. Want to join in the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode? Join the Babel Conference, our listeners' discussion group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field, and we look forward to seeing you there. This is Steve Sansweet of Rancho Obi-Wan, and you're listening to the 602 Club. There was a little bar in Mill Valley where all the Starfleet trainees used to go. The 602 Club. You know it. <laughs> I was there more times than I can remember. Hey guys, welcome to another supplemental episode of the 602 Club. So excited to bring this one to you as it is the Farewell to Rebels panel that I got to be a part of at Dragon Con and moderate uh, with none other than Henry Gilroy, who is the co-executive producer of Star Wars Rebels, as well as Thrawn author and Thrawn Alliance's author, as well as, of course, the Thrawn trilogy, Hand of Thrawn, and so many other Star Wars books, Timothy Zahn, and a couple other great people, Bria and Tom. We got to talk about our love for Rebels and everything that had happened in the fourth season and throughout the series. So I hope you'll enjoy the panel. Definitely, uh, you know, as you're enjoying the panel, you know, hit us up uh, the star rating review over there on iTunes. Let people know that you like the 602 Club. Uh, follow us on Twitter at Trek FM, Facebook at Facebook.com slash Trek FM. There's the listeners only discussion group, of course, that you can find over on Facebook. Just type Babel into the search field uh, or uh, hit discussion on any of the menu bars you see uh, there on the website at Trek.fm. And then last but not least, want to thank our associate producers through Patreon, uh, Ken Tripp, Davis Grayson, and Daniel Noah for supporting the show here and making sure that all of this content keeps coming to you each and every week. If you would like to be part of the team, go over to patreon.com slash trekfm and see how you can become part of the team and make sure all of these shows come to you each and every week. Thanks again for listening, and I hope you will enjoy this special presentation of the Rebels panel at Dragon Con from 2018. Quick side note, there was an audio snafu, so you will catch the panel in progress. I think that's one of the things that I found so interesting, especially in, in the rewatch of the series, is there uh, is a character arc for so many of the characters, and not just the main character. But there are a lot of characters in this show that get an opportunity to have an arc that you're not expecting. And so I was going to ask the panel, uh, is there a a standout or favorite maybe besides the main crew that you just weren't expecting? And you're like, oh, man, this is such a great story. I mean, up until Celebration, I wasn't really expecting episodes on Mandalore itself until Celebration. It was really nice to see that and to see the culture itself, how it had evolved. It's funny you should say that. In the beginning of the series, uh, David said, yeah, we're absolutely not going to Mandalore because we simply cannot afford it. <laughs> and until we got to the point where like, oh, we actually have to go to Mandalore. So there was a need to, I think, out of a narrative yeah. that related specifically to the character and the character's advancement. So I think there was a, a necessary, you know, I think a lot of people like the, the turn of ancient Callus. Um, yeah, right. yeah. He, you know, yeah. became like this bitter, you know, awful Asian callous to sexy callous. Yeah. So <laughs> when he became, when he joined the rebellion, it's hot so callous. people were saying, "Wait, is it hot it's callous or hot sexy callous. callous?" It's hot callous. Yeah. Is that it's a new? Callous. Is that a new thing? No, that that's the, okay. That wait, wait. The OG. What, what's the callous canon? It's it's hot callous with like the exclamation callous. point in the middle. Okay, you guys know about like when. We first show his hit, him walk into the room on in season four uh-huh. when we delivered the the animation to um, Disney. We had like this kind of sexy rap song, like. Oh. <laughs> I think it was nice. Connie said, "Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah." <laughs> and nice. and and, Disney, and, and, and Disney loved it because it was like so. As soon as Callus stepped in any shot, you'd hear this kind of music dial up. It was like sexy Callus music. So. Sexy, knows it. All, all the ladies on the, on the crew and, you know, others really loved Sexy Callus. So I, I especially appreciated that in lesser writers' hands, Sabine would have risen to rule Mandalore. The fact that she realized this is not my strength, I'll pass it on to someone who can do it better, 
is a very mature thing to do, and you don't, don't always see that in, in fiction, especially animated fiction. I'll really see that in real life either. I mean, yeah. I think that's really good. I think that was that's a really good uh, foreshadowing for maybe things to come for Mandalore. And, and yeah. I will stand by my Sabine should be Mandalore, even though Tim's sitting next to me. <laughs> um, but no, actually, as far as Sabine maybe goes, stay, but she's not ready now, right? Maria, ready. it's okay to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Would you know? <laughs> I lied to you. I'm just kidding. I lied to you about space marriage. <laughs> no, I, I um, tease you, but it, it I mean, she, I think, has enough um, uh, enough smarts to know this isn't hers. But also you have to realize she's actually sees what people with power um, have to go through. If you think about her mom as actually this, she, her mom really had to become a cold, callous person um, to make her family strong, but also to basically kind of fight off the other Mandalorians, but also she's seen what what people with power turn into, and if more so than anything, she's learned that lesson from the Jedi around her and Kanan and Ezra. Am I, I convincing just, you yet? No, oh. because I would just like to think that Sabine has, because she's learned from watching everyone and what we saw her go through. And uh, I think my favorite episode is Trials of the Dark Saber because it's just so emotional, and and Tia's voice acting performance in that is absolutely incredible. Um, but we, we get her backstory and we see we see what she's gone through and she's become so much stronger for it that I think sometimes you need the person who you don't expect to be the leader. And I would have, I don't know, even coming in with a little bit of bias as someone who's also part Asian, but I would have really liked to see an Asian woman ruling Mandalore. I, again, I, I would say in 10 years when she's gotten more experience and the people know her better, Handing the the authority off to her would make sense. I don't think at this point. Fight for the point, dark saber. Hmm? Fight for the dark saber. A fight for it? Not necessarily. Oh, I think just yeah. I recognize the. I Leave me alone. <laughs> I Welcome can fight to the some- rebels panel. I'm getting teamed up on. She can fight I, somebody else. I think one of the things that um, and the character that stood out to me, especially in the rewatch, that I was just shocked by this, really see some growth, especially because he came over from the Clone Wars, was to see Hondo at the end say, "For Ezra, I would do anything." You know, like. For him to come to the point where he has a character that and a, and a person that he cares about as much as himself, uh, along with Melch, um, you know, because he really loves Melch. He, he won't admit it, but he loves Melch. Um, and so I, but the fact that, that Ezra has impressed him, but I also think he says Ezra reminds me of what the galaxy used to be like. And that's something I think that's really special. And it, it was really special about Kanan and Ezra that in some small way, they were able to recapture what the Jedi should have been. They were the beauty of what the Jedi were meant to be. They were meant to be in the thick of it with the people on the ground, helping a planet. Like that that arc, and, and I think you see that there's that recognition in Hondo that I, I for these characters, I would do anything. And that's a, that's a, I mean, that's unexpected. Actually, think about it. It's, there's a little bit of that. It, it takes a community, you know, to raise a child. Um, in this particular case, I definitely think, you know, if you think about Hondo's earliest interaction with Ezra, it was sort of like, hey, you know, I see a lot of you in me. And I think that this was a chance for Hondo um, to have a little bit of legacy. Maybe he's, you know, getting close to the end of his career, and here's someone actually who he could have been. You know, what if he had kind of turned away and, and, and maybe Ben is less selfish. I think, you know, but he's still himself, but I think underneath that, there's there's our, that, that fondness is you, you have to admire people who are noble. So one of the things that uh, this show does is, is add to the saga. And I was really excited to see the ways in which Rebels really adds to everything. And uh, one of the things we get is the world between worlds, which is a massive uh, introduction. A lo- I mean, uh, stands alongside Mortis is one of the craziest out there ideas of what the force is. So tell us a little bit about that, Henry, because I think that's something that, I don't know, I know I saw it and it blew my mind. Yeah, so much of this actually uh, is based on conversations that Dave had with George. Um, so I, I I can't speak to all of it, except that I do know, and this is something that actually Dave and I did discuss during Clone Wars, was the, the manifestations of the force. Specifically, there's the living force, there's the the force that that that's in us, and then it's in living creatures, and it surrounds us, and it connects living creatures. And then there's the, the idea of the cosmic force, which is 
this kind of overall sort of kind of just passionate like power source energy field that kind of thing so and i think the world between worlds is is more about the kind of nexus of the two but it definitely because you're you're talking about time and space manipulation and that kind of weirdness cosmic weirdness is definitely more of i think the cosmic force i think to explain it all um (laughs) takes the magic out of it so um i probably couldn't explain it anyway because i don't understand it so um, (laughs) so i'm with you on that i I just think that it's um it's a way to broaden the mystic aspects of the force um rather than try to um ground it in science what did the rest of the panel think when you saw that episode how did that strike you because i I know every fan had a different reaction i thought that 2d animation that they did was gorgeous um on the cave wall that was drop dead beautiful um I struggle a little bit with the concept occasionally, um, just blunt honesty, because uh, I'm not a, the world's biggest fan of Mortis. But when I was rewatching the series last weekend before I came here, I did find a, a strong appreciation for it. Cause it's just very beautifully done. I think for myself, I mean, I, at first when I watched it, I mean, I you know, I it, it was a little bit more out there than I'm used to. I didn't fully understand it. Um, then I started going back and thinking about some of the other things I had seen, and um, that was um, I was out at Lucasfilm about a year ago, and Dave had shown us I think it was episode six in season four, which was the wolves, the, when the wolves save Sabine and, and Ezra, yeah, and Lothal, and I'm thinking to myself, why in the world are these wolves getting involved in this thing? <laughs> I mean, I know Dave loves wolves and everything, but what does what does all this mean? And so then you know the more you kind of watch those episodes with the Loth Wolves and you kind of see how they have really high connections to the Force and now you've got the world between worlds it it kind of just shows you how connected everything is through the Force I mean everything time, space fly forms people everything's connected through the Force well I admit my first thoughts after watching that were okay so this is a rift it was found by Jedi. It has taken on Jedi characteristics. What if there are others that were found by the Sith and started working that direction? So, uh, to be pitched to Lucasfilm at some point. <laughs> it's okay to be wrong, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I only say that Sorry, because mate. because <laughs> when you think about it, it's like there's a reason Sidious wants yes. this. Yeah. And if the Sith had access to it, then he wouldn't be going out of his way to get to it. So the Sith don't have if there was one <laughs> not yet <laughs> if there was one that was found and then lost by the Sith in other words if there's someplace else or found by some other group of forest users entirely would it take on their characteristics and what kind of story could it build around that I agree that they don't if there was one it is either lost or is dissipated or whatever but what are the mechanics of this because all, all stuff even magic whatever force stuff has a physics of some sort. There are rules it all has to follow. There's physics and, in space in hmm? Star Wars? There's physics in space. What? Yes, yes, physics. One I, of the things that I thought was fascinating, because I felt like what it did is it it blew open Obi-Wan Kenobi saying, you know, it binds the galaxy together. Yeah. We actually saw how the Force, in some ways, binds space and time together, and that there is a place that the Jedi and these Mortis gods had been able to find an opportunity to have some connection with. And I thought that that was so brilliant to combine all those ideas, you know, these loaf wolves, you get the Mortis gods and you get something like the world between worlds. And you really start to see just how big the force is and what it means to this galaxy. And that, um, again, I think you see, um, you know, the importance of guiding it on the light side, because from the dark side, I mean, who knows what Sidious would do with this thing and how he would rip the galaxy apart with it if he used it like he would probably want to. And so I just I thought putting all that together really made something that it is a mystery. And then the fun of it is that it is a mystery. We don't have all the answers. And that makes it more exciting because you may explore it, but it may always be like Yoda. I don't know what planet he comes from or, you know, what his history is. But that's kind of what makes him a great character is that there's a part of him that we always just get to speculate on. Yeah, and and I always got the sense to that. Um, if somebody else had gone into that world between the worlds, they would have experienced something completely differently. They would have heard different voices echoing 
um, the portals would have been different. So it's all about what you bring into it um, and, and what your experiences are and what your connections are. Because um, all of the characters are connected in some way. So is this a more elaborate version of the cave on uh, Dagobah? You take in what you, what's there is what you take in? I, I'm not saying that. Um, I'm, I'm saying that. <laughs> I'm trying they're, they're, not to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's okay to tell us things we're not supposed to know. <laughs> it really is. It really it's is. It's not okay for me to be wrong. Only you guys. Are you sure about that? <laughs> well, so I don't know about you, but I think we may have all had a, a cosmic cheer when we saw this scene of Ahsoka lives. Yeah. Um, and, you know, um, I, I think, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Great shirt. Um, but the idea that... Uh, Dave just went full on Lord of the Rings at the end of this thing. It was pretty awesome. I mean, he wasn't even hiding it at this point. I mean, the staff. The Seriously, staff. the staff. I mean, Ahsoka the White, you know, G- Gimli and Legolas. I mean, Callus and Zeb go on a journey together afterwards. Um, but I just, this this part, it was emotional. Like, I, this character is the one that started it all with us for animation. And to see her again and to know that that she's still out there and could affect the galaxy in pretty amazing ways with maybe finding Ezra, you know, maybe finding Thawne, who knows? I mean, just, I, I, I just, I jumped up and down a lot. My wife can attest I may have squeed like a little girl. So, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a proud of it. I'm really proud of it. How did it affect you guys? I mean, I fist pumped. If that, you know, I was like, <laughs> well, when he's standing there watching, I'm like, you got to gotta save her dude you know like and then when when he, she comes out when he pulls around she's like i'm like Ugh! done yeah. like done i didn't really I, I didn't much it's hard for me to relate to jedi characters i didn't really care for ahsoka in the early part portion of the clone wars i grew to really like her and i grew to really it really bothered me when she left the jedi order when she came back in with rebels i was way more um attached to her yeah you know so yeah it's nice to see her later yeah, when she came to that ladder in season two, it was oh, like yeah. it was another moment where I, I just it blew my mind. It was the best ladder scene ever. It was the best ladder scene ever. <laughs> so uh, Thrawn and Ezra, you know, possibly live, and um, so I'm, I'm sure you have you know plans for him of what you'd like to see. But how did that make you feel to actually see the scene and realize that character, as Dave promised, is yep. still alive? Uh, my first thought, having watched that, was Ezra, Thrawn, the space whales, gone for four years, candy store. <laughs> <laughs> Only right now we're waiting for anybody to let me let me do anything because Dave hasn't decided what if he wants to do anything with those characters in that in that era. And if J.J. Abrams in F9 references anything in this timeline, that puts a block of stone there as well that we all have to work around. So people way up the food chain are having to make decisions. And right now, I'm just kind of sitting around waiting, uh, thinking about what I would like to do if they ever give me permission. But yeah, there's all sorts of possibilities with that ending. I just I just see you sitting there wishing and hoping and thinking and praying and like texting Dave, not responding, not responding, not responding. <laughs> New phone do this. <laughs> so I, I, I want to ask you, Henry, what the heck happened to the Inquisitors? They just kind of disappear. Yeah. What about Seven's sister? Why, why did you do that to her? Why did you break my heart? Didn't she kill a bunch of people? It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> It's fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> what was that? Inquisitor Justice she was dispensing or something? It's all from a certain point of view. <laughs> well, her her point of view, I think, was without a head, wasn't it? Oh. It's fine. Kana's point of view was out without eyes. I can't remember if in the originally she got her head chopped off and then Maul kicked her head down the stairs or something. Oh. Like that. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm just being mean to you. Henry Gilroy <laughs> hates me. Playing soccer with her head. Yeah. Your costume was amazing, though, last thank year. You. So thank you. I know this is what this is about, this time you spent putting in the costume. Um, <laughs> that's actually a great question. Um, and I think, uh, you know, obviously we've seen the Inquisitors in other media. 
uh, in the comic books, and, and I believe they're in video games too, and, and novels too. Am I correct about that? Yeah, they've been okay. in novels. So I, I think that their their presence is around, and I think there's probably a great story um, about, you know, that kind of indicates why we don't see them in season three or four. Um, as a matter of fact, I did pitch one, um, um, and who knows, maybe, you know, maybe one day we'll see. But I, I think in season three, we, we really wanted to move um, – the, I'll say the force villain or the kind of mystical villain um, and to be more of a personal villain um, with uh, Dark Maul. Or not Dark Maul, but Maul. And I think that's something that we, we, we really paid off, uh, had the opportunity to pay off his story and kind of show where he came from and where he was going in a great way. Um, so, I don't know, is that enough? That's not enough. That's really not an answer, is it? No, I, th- I think... I- one of the things that you mentioned the comics right now, and, and they are dealing with the Darth Vader comics specifically, is dealing with the Inquisitors and Vader's relationship with them. Uh, and it's pretty contentious, you know, and uh, he doesn't really like them all that much. So I'm actually fascinated to see how that ties in with the fact that, you know, where is that in the time period? And is this how and why we, you know, because Vader finds a way to slowly get rid of all of them because he wants to be the only Force user next to Palpatine's side, which makes sense. I mean, Anakin's not known for not being jealous, um, so especially with his position. So I, I think that makes a lot of sense that you know, and like you said, storytelling wise, you're going from all, and that's where you're going with the story, and and that's what you need to tell the story. So um, I did want to ask you this, you know, just real quickly. You know, we got a lot of wolves and cats, and obviously Dave, huge fan of wolves. Um, but was there anything else for you guys as you were putting those characters into those situations? And what were you trying to do? with them specifically uh, that maybe had to do with Ezra, maybe his connection with the Force? Was there any other specific story points that you were really trying to hit? Yeah, I I think it's also something that's sort of a part of Star Wars, and that's the creatures. It it, it kind of separates, like, Star Wars from a lot of other storytelling, the fantastical creatures you see, whether it's, you know, Bantha or... or, um, Dianoga, or I mean, there's so many creatures that I think give it a wonder, and that's kind of right out of the Flash Gordon. So when you see something Star Wars and there was a weird creature in it, um, you go, "Wow, that's that's cool and different." Um, as far as like wolves and cats specifically, yeah, <laughs> Dave has uh, cats at home, and he would probably have a pet wolf at home if he could. So, uh, uh, so definitely he has that. But there's also, I think, kind of underlying um, mythological reasons. Uh, and, and what wolves mean as, as um, you know, spirit animals. And that's something that's kind of a, 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 a I want to say, universal um, in, in the way that we, we treat wolves and the way that we react to wolves and, and who wolves are in mythology. So I think um, the wolf can ha- take on many roles and then specifically their connection to the forest and having the idea that animals actually have kind of a more natural connection to the forest. It doesn't, that isn't, it, it isn't interfered with like, person's ego um they just react to instinct and, and, and that's something that's kind of like grounded um to nature and life and, and i also felt like it, it seemed to be one of those places where it showed us a lot about who ezra is as a character and again i think ezra's natural connection to his surroundings and paying attention to his surroundings and caring about everything not just um you know uh people but animals and and like i loved how the Purgle episode, which kind of seemed silly, you know, in that second uh, second season, it really made sense once you got to the end. And then the wolf connection with the, and, and the wolf cats, all of that went into play to show, I think, in a lot of ways, again, Ezra is the type of Jedi that we should have had if they had not lost some things, maybe during the prequel era. And Ezra has a connection to the Force that allows him to respect all living things yeah. as one should. Yeah, I mean, we have those a uh, couple of episodes. There's season one, uh, Ezra and the Fear Nox, yeah. you know, yeah. um, but also in season two when he has that vision of the white love cat with the blue eyes, and then later on, you know, he ends up chasing it and it leads him to, you know, um, writer Zadi. I think the idea of him having, um, at least in my mind, I always write wrote him with having this ability to connect with with other creatures and at first it manifests through animals and, but it's something that Kanan actually fosters and helps him along with. So, um, you're absolutely right. I don't know if you think about, you know, Jedi having 
um, certain talents that they're better at. Like there might be a Jedi that has, you know, better, you know, swordsmanship and my, one other might be a better pilot. Um, and, and maybe, you know, somebody who's really practiced can, that they're around nature. I thought it was kind of interesting that a city boy actually, mm-hmm. ha- actually had this natural talent to, um, connect with, um, animals, um, but also other living creatures as well. Yeah. He's a very, he becomes a very, uh, empathic character as time goes on. Yeah. Which is, uh, is something that's very different because at the beginning of the series, he's all out for himself. And by the end, he's become the selfless. And that's the lesson that Kanan was trying to teach him. Yeah, it's funny. When you when you just look at it, it's, it's right there in his name, Bridger. Like, he is the one who brings these people together and, like, assembles, like, the most unlikeliest uh, uh, gang of people to defeat the Empire. So it's a, I don't know, it's a classic Star Wars story to me. And it's Lord of the Rings again, even the most unlikely of person, you know, the smallest of beings can ha- change the course of the future. And Ezra, in many ways, and, and this little band of rebels do that all on their own in the end. So that's pretty special. Um, one of the things, obviously, is we get Maul and, and his, his end. Um, and I thought this was something that was kind of poetic, uh, especially with the way that it does end between him and Obi-Wan. And again, it's sad, actually, to see him so broken and and you know earlier uh, in that confrontation obi-wan says i've seen where you come from and he has such pity for his enemy to realize this is not the life you chose this is the life that was forced on you and you feel like you have no other choice and the the pain in that for obi-wan he didn't want it to be a fight i just i thought that that was a a beautiful way to go yeah he it's it's just like in the death star you know, Vader turns on the lightsaber first. I think at this point, really, Obi Wan has no intention of fighting until Maul kind of gets around to like, oh, you're here protecting something, and then that's when you know Obi Wan has to act. So, again, it's it's knowledge and defense, use of the Force, you know, not aggression. And I think the the pity, like you were saying, is Maul just hasn't learned. He never let go of the hate. He felt like, okay, if I finally go back and kill Obi Wan, this will solve my hate. But really, he didn't. In, in Maul's eyes, in my mind, the Maul Ezra story really is about legacy, about this character who had this power. He, he had achieved power. He had grown his stature and gotten all these physical possessions, but really it, it, he ended up with nothing. Mm-hmm. And really the things that are important to you should be, or the things that should be important to you are your connections to other people mm-hmm. and, 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 and taking care of them and lifting them up rather than dominating them and controlling them. And he kind of says it in all so many words, but... Yeah, at the end, he's just laying in his arms, and it's like you know, he closes his eyes. Like, yeah. it's it's a sad moment rather than a you know a, a fist raising. We beat the bad guy moment. How did the rest of the panel feel about watching that end? Did it did it to live up to maybe any expectations once Maul had come back in the Clone Wars, and you thought this could be a possibility? I, I like Henry's analysis of that. Yeah, Maul was in a relationship that, as a. a, a with Sidious, lost that, tries to build a relationship with Ezra, loses that. He, he's just alone, and he doesn't want to be alone, but doesn't know any other way to do it. My other thought was, yeah, we've seen him bisected, and he survived, so hopefully this is really it. <laughs> <laughs> we, we actually joked about, because we there was like, hey, you know, this is a final battle between the two guys. Like, should we see like some 20-minute fight? And we thought about, like, cutting away back to like um, the planet with Hera and Kano like gosh we haven't heard heard from Ezra and then cutting back and the fight's still going on and then you know cutting back and Ezra's roasting a hot dog over the fire and they're (laughs) still fighting they're still fighting and then we joked about an epilogue where where you see Obi-Wan like Bearing body part over here, and body part over here, and body part over there, and you see all these piles separated by hundreds of miles, and then the hand comes up. <laughs> um, so we feel you, I, 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 and, and I, as I've said, I think I've done uh, on Rebels Recon that oh, what, it wasn't this epic battle. It's like yeah, because these guys have fought so many times, they know each other's moves. So this is going to be a, 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 a samurai master battle. It's a, all of the fighting is actually being done in their head before they attack. So exactly. That was one of the episodes where I felt the marketing kind of did a, a disservice because they showed us so much of what the 
fight and their meeting was that when we got to it, it uh, for me upon a first watch, it felt a little anticlimactic. But when I watched it again, and then I was like, okay, expectations, put them aside. It's not going to be Nebu round two. It's I like I said, I appreciated the samurai ness of it and how it was that level, but. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we would have had to stop, you know, and there's like a Gatorade station. They're old guys, you know. <laughs> okay, time out, time out, time yeah. out, time out. I mean, to, catch breath. Just so you don't tell me I'm wrong again. I just want to say, like, I liked it. I just, I just felt the marketing kind of was like, I was like, wait, what? But I saw, I saw all, like, saw 90% of it. What are you doing? But aside from that, I liked it. I think the lightsaber fight itself tells really the whole story mm-hmm. about those two because Maul basically tries to go after Obi Wan with the same exact move that he went against Qui-Gon and that in and of itself shows that Maul has never grown he's never grown as a person he's still the same place he was all those years ago back on Naboo when him and Obi-Wan fought Obi-Wan stood stood there and waited instead of coming forward with his lightsaber on this you know this brash attack like he did when he was a Padawan because Obi-Wan grew Obi-Wan had, had grown and he, he had wisdom which was something that exactly. Maul severely lacked was wisdom. He had knowledge, but he had no wisdom. And you can have all the knowledge all day long, but if you have no wisdom in how to apply that knowledge, you have nothing. And that's exactly what that that whole lightsaber battle showed that. So a character that you were telling me uh, behind the scenes that you were really interested in and wanted to to kind of explain a little bit more was this Hayden character. Yeah, actually, it's funny. I actually created Hayden for season three. Um, because uh, I think David mentioned in some panel that originally Maul wasn't going to live at the end of season two. He was actually killed in Twilight of the Press. Um, and so we were trying to figure out, like, hey, if we're not going to have the Inquisitors for season three, like, what's going on? So I had always been excited about, like, a Bellic kind of, uh, Bellic, uh, Rene Bellic from the Raiders of the Lost Ark, the Empire, the Emperor having, uh, like, a, an archaeologist who basically was kind of scouring. Um, the galaxy for these um, uh, uh, Jedi temples uh, for two reasons. Number one, to wipe them away, but also to seek out any of the secrets they might have, specifically the world between worlds. He knows that this stuff is out there, but he can't access it, but he can at least send somebody out there to explore it. So um, in season three, actually, the um, I had him actually be a, a bigger presence and I think I had him with Crimson Guards and stuff who... So he was going to be kind of more of the mystical villain because we tended in our on our series to have like sort of the the military villains and then we had sort of like force villains. And we kind of tried to try to try to build our, our mythology out with two different kinds of stories so you could have like a variety of, of, of you know, plots. But Haydn, I thought, was a really... Could be a really interesting character who... who um, you know, got closer and closer to the world between worlds. Um, but at the time, we really didn't know what that was until we got into season four. But I, I just thought, uh, yeah, uh, Malcolm McDowell did the voice, and he, he brought a great, great presence to him. Yeah. And um, anyway, that's the idea. If anybody has questions, I can answer. Them. One last thing that uh, I kind of wanted to mention was uh, <laughs> the fact that we did get confirmation that they were space married. Um, about and time. I didn't see her. Is she wearing a ring? I can't see that. Yeah. I, it's I, close I, enough. Um, Space Mary doesn't involve have to involve rings. Yeah, they didn't have time Remember for rings this last year. You know? um, but I, I, what, one of the things that struck me so much about this, and it's something that um, I talked to my friend John Mills about, and um, we had batted back and forth um, together, uh, is this idea that one of the things that Hera and Kanan are able to do is be a Jedi in a relationship and do it correctly. That his attachment to her never gets in the way. Uh, and when it would get in the way, he gives the mission to he- Kane, I mean, to Ezra. And so, to me, it, it, it almost seemed to, to show the way in which Jedi can ha- could have attachment and do it correctly. And I thought that was really fascinating because, again, I think it, it in the end, Kane and, and Ezra show us that Jedi could have done things differently um, and how they could have been more successful. Uh, yeah, I, I guess maybe you're right. The bureaucracy of the Jedi order back in the times of Republic, that's, that could be true. Um, I, I, when I think about it, I, I think that you don't have the burden of the whole order for Kanan to actually have to follow the rules, but also up until 
season four, um, Hera has really put the war first and the mission first. Um, and, you know, she obviously loves Kanan, but that doesn't mean that, um, you know, they're, they're having a relationship because they've got this war to fight. They have a bigger mission. So I think the idea of, you know, that sort of acceptance and, and love that kind of happens, it, you're right, it was unsaid for a long time. So I think it's really satisfying when you finally get it um, because it does bring closure and it brings truth, really. It's, it's a lot of it is about, oh, wow, okay, this is out in the open rather than, yeah, we know these two people care deeply for each other, which I think happens a lot in a lot of, a lot of relationships. So that I think a lot of people really like the honesty of it because we've all been in relationships like that where someone might want more, but the other person's unable to give them more depending on life situations. I have a question. When did Jason happen? (laughs) Y'all can go ahead up and line up for some questions. That's no, great... really, I, I'm honestly curious, like, I, cause I got confused by the timeline when I was watching. So, so when did Jason happen? <laughs> okay. So I think there's a scene in, um, the episode where Hera flies away, where we open it with, um, Kanan and is out meditating and Hera comes out and says, Oh, you're not going with them to go recover the part or whatever, the mm-hmm. hyperdive. And then he says like, there's a reason, you know, we came back here and all of that. So there's actually, there is a time cut. Um, I think it's a dissolve. So a mm-hmm. lot of things can happen in a dissolve. <laughs> so that's why he's not going and getting the part. <laughs> I'm not saying what kind of things happen in a dissolve. I'm just saying a lot of things happen. So people fly across the galaxy. People I'm have so coffee. Right <laughs> I need to not put myself near a microphone. I'm just curious as how Dave knew that Han and Leia named their son after Hera's son. Because I never put that in the books. <laughs> <laughs> but clearly they did, so you know it's the force. It's not how the force works. Go for it, Logan. <laughs> okay, so this is for Mr. Gilroy. And uh, my stalker. Once again, you I've said it before. First in line. I've said it. I've said it before. I'll say it again. I was at the panel before you. Anyways, <laughs> so my question is: What happened to Commander Cody after um, Order sixty six and Revenge of the Sith? Because there was an answer in Legends, but there's ha- but there hasn't been one for Canon. Can you tell me what happened in Legends? In Legends, he w- became a trainer on Kamino and was like um, basically extremely disappointed in the stormtroopers and called them all a bunch of idiots, pretty much. Wow. Um, actually, yeah, we we had talked about um, bringing. Cody into Rebels, actually. Um, And the idea that, um, you know, because once Thrawn realizes that the Rebels are actually using former clones, he would do his diligence and research and actually probably bring in someone to help with that. And we thought it would be really interesting if perhaps Cody was still working with the Empire. So it probably would have led up to the confrontation between Cody and Rex. That's possible. Uh, All right, thank you. Am I allowed to ask another question? No. Is Please? it hashtag Space Mary? No, it's not. I don't have a t-shirt this year. I want to know what happened to Barris because she wasn't the seventh sister like someone said she was. So what happened to Barris? Why did you look at someone over there? Because they kept telling me that seventh sister was Barris and then she wasn't. So. Oh, I don't I, I, I'm sure that their Marvel comics and games and novels are probably something that will talk about what happened to Paris. You're breaking my heart. <laughs> um, I have my idea of what could happen. I can't tell you that. Why not? Because I think Lucasfilm owns it. Oh, fine. Um, my question is for Henry. You were talking about how, you know, de- the World Between Worlds was something that Dave and George had apparently talked about when, you know, way back when. And I watched the episode, and I appreciated the fact that it wasn't straight up time travel. It's not like, okay, I'm going to go here, and I'm going to change this, and then I'm going to go back. It's because, like, when you see Ahsoka walk down the steps at the end of season three, or season two, and then season four, you immediately cut to that. So it's not like there's an alternate timeline where she died or Invader won. But I will say... Has Dave like made any rules about okay, you know, we're not allowing uh, time travel or anything, or could it still be a possibility? Because the, I, the way I see that the Force works is like the Force is like okay, if the Force was a person, 
I made this decision. Now I'm making sure that I made the right decision. Um, okay. I'm trying to understand exactly their questions. I don't think there's time travel in the way that you're thinking about it. Well, that, that's, well, that's my it's, it's, thing is because when I, I, I told my cousin about, and he hasn't watched the episode, he just got done with Clone Wars, so I have to show him all of Rebels. But he was like, oh, it's time travel. They're trying to, you know, give themselves a way out in case they, you know, screw up or whatever. And I'm like, no, it's not time travel because you're not changing anything. It's still flowing. But I was just wondering if Dave has maybe mentioned that that could be a possibility about not, someone not going to, into. Okay, so not to me. He hasn't said that. To Dave me. did oh. say in an interview that uh, it's not that. It's not about time travel about knowledge and there and that you can't just pop in and out of different uh holes you know that you see that, that that's not how it works it, it's and, specifically yeah. that like those experiences are specific to ezra mm-hmm. and his experience that's why when somebody else went into the world between worlds they would experience something completely different okay thank you oh and tell dave we said hi <laughs> uh kind of a question for maybe all of y'all um you did a really good job with star wars rebels and clone wars um, but looking at how well the new movies were received, um, I personally and my niece personally felt that uh, Ray was kind of hated, but if it had been about Ahsoka, it would have been much better received, especially moving into The Last Jedi and having Ahsoka meet Luke and the fact that she's the only experienced Jedi who originally knew Anakin and could wrap up everything. I'm sorry, did you say Ray was hated by audiences? Because well, that's not hated. right. I'm she <laughs> that's very wrong. Yeah, she well, was but not also, liked uh, by uh, some. Uh, also, but uh, Ahsoka was really... She would be way, I, I be way doing, older, though, I think. Yeah, that's uh, where the whole yeah. time travel thing I think you're doing in. a huge disservice yeah. to Ray, yeah. to the fans she has. Yeah. Well, it's like I said, more, it's more so a question of Ahsoka was an established character going in. Yeah, but you have to remember really, that Ahsoka was a brand new character 10 years ago. Yeah. People hated Ahsoka. Yeah. And I mean, into yeah. the level yeah. of that I've never seen people treat Rey before. Entertainment <laughs> Weekly had rated her as the second worst yeah. character, yeah. Star Wars character ever. It's almost like sometimes fans really like to find ways to dislike yeah. talented female characters and fandom. Well, no. um, well, I think I'm you're saying. doing her a huge yeah. disservice. Yeah, but like I said, it was it was a Ahsoka was mine and my niece's favorite character, and just watching her go through, and she was just such a a difference between her and. Anakin. Man, you got yeah. like more Clone Wars episodes yeah. coming, man. Yeah. That, well, so okay. Should be back. The, uh, I she think coming. We, just FYI, we only have five minutes, okay. so let's try and get in as many questions as we can. I was wondering about the Inquisitors. I guess from the Grand Inquisitor, I assumed that a lot of them were just turned Jedi who'd been captured, and any Jedi who were captured who wouldn't turn or just killed. Um, or was there anything definitively decided about that for their backstory? Yeah, actually, that's really great that you should ask. Um, I think that though who the, the 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 Jedi who were chosen to be Inquisitors were chosen ahead of time and not killed, so they were probably stunned. And I think Palpatine basically kept an eye out for Jedi who we saw during the Clone Wars who were too aggressive, or who might have been too vain, or who were selfish. And I think that those those human frailties he knew he could exploit, especially if he said, "Okay, I give you a chance to live," or having to basically uh, kill you, so I'm gonna. Um, but I'm also gonna unleash you, and I think that that promise of power was probably um, sure. But he knew that there were still enough Jedi out there and, and Force users upcoming that he would need to deal with. So yeah. there's also they talk about the Inquisitors a lot in the Darth Vader comic that's being written by Charles Saul right now. So in the um, in the Clone Wars and such, the lightsaber was like a very revered how it was made, very revered, very sacred kind of act. But in Rebels, you had Ezra that just kind of like threw pieces together in a crystal. You had Kanan that kind of pieced this together that he pulled apart. Um, what did you think of the re- of how the lightsaber was made in Rebels compared to the Clone Wars? Well, I, Kanan basically was hiding his lightsaber. So it, it, it had that form for a reason. We actually had... A two-minute sequence where Ezra was like meditating and doing the se- the whole thing with putting it together, but we wanted it. We'd already seen that. We'd already seen that in an earlier thing. So I think the idea of, and then I think it's even said, like, where do you get the pieces from it? Oh, Sabine gave him some battery packs, and 
and he made it his own. You know, he put a blaster in it. I mean, it's it's kind of cool that you don't we didn't actually have to go through the same steps because we have an idea already. So this, this is a question. The last question. I'm sorry. So this is a question more for all of you. Throughout the series, there's been a bunch of moments where everybody, everybody in the entire Star Wars community, sort of uh, freaked out or it was like completely had their full attention on something. Be it the world between worlds, Obi Wan and Maul, Ahsoka and Vader. What was the most interesting thing for you all to see the community react to after it aired on TV? Uh, out of which? Out of which episode? Out of everything. Out of everything. Out of everything in Rebels. Like, yeah. yeah, out of everything. Oh, I've got a good answer. Uh, so if you went to Celebration and you were in the Rebels panel, you went through emotional whiplash because we got guys. I've got some really bad news for you. Season four is going to be the last one. But hey, you want to see a trailer? And then everyone's excited. And they're like, hey, you want to see an episode? And we're like, yes, awesome. And then we see the first half of the start of season four. <laughs> Y'all don't know how season four starts? What's in that break? Oh, yeah. Everyone supposedly dying. And I don't feel so good. You get out. <laughs> so for me, the fun part, it was it was kind of fun for me to, to, or painful for me to watch and see everyone be like, oh, it's fine. And all of us who saw the episode of Celebration being like, you don't know the pain we've been through. We've waited six long months. I think for me, the most exciting, and I think I can speak for, for the, the community that I represent as well, uh, when we see six different clans of Mandalorians show up, and they're all yeah. painted differently, and we all look at each other and we're like, we're all different. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're like, we've been working so hard, and we now we are seen obsessed. It. I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't apologize. I appreciate it. That will have to be it. Uh, we are doing a drawing, so look at the back of your...